Kicking off the list at number 10, got a passport. Ramses II is known as one of the greatest ancient Egyptian rulers of all time. He was called Ramses the Great, so that's a good sign already. At a young age, he fought in harsh battles to protect the borders of Egypt, and during his reign, the Egyptian army reached 100,000 men. That's a pretty large army. He was later referred to as the Great Ancestor, and it didn't take long for Ramses II to declare himself a god. It's always fun being like, hey, by the way, I'm a god now. That's how cool I am. 30 years into his ruling, Ramses was ritually turned into an Egyptian god. It was a formal thing. Though it wasn't until 3,000 years later until Ramses would truly soar through the skies. He was buried in his treasure after 96 years of living, and in 1974, he finally started to show signs of aging. Not too bad. He went from being on display to being sent to Paris to get a glow up, you know, to preserve the king's body even longer. Instead of being listed as luggage on the way to Paris, the pharaoh was given an official Egyptian passport for the commute. The government gave a mummy a passport. This is like the first five minutes of a horror film. Under occupation, it even said king. And there was even a small disclaimer noting that he was in fact still dead. You can never be too sure, you know? Number nine, baboon tattoos. Ancient Egyptians worshiped animals. This is common knowledge now at this point. We've heard about their love towards cats, which I'll explain later on, but what about baboons? Yeah, they were pretty important pieces to this ancient puzzle as well. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. Now, one of the most strange things that pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Imagine stealing a pair for your family and then four baboons start doing parkour, chasing you down. That's so alarming. I would just throw it and be like, please stop. You're so scary and strong. They train baboons to pick fruit. They train them to make beer and they also train them to entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to tattoo one on my arm. So you know what? I get it. Get a Harambe tattoo. I'm like, you know, I, it's, I, I see it. I see the similarities. Number eight, worship dung beetles. So worshiping a baboon that dances and makes holiday ales, yeah, I can see how one would worship such a creature. That makes sense. But pharaohs also worship dung beetles and their reasoning may surprise you. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way naturally. Animals are born with natural instincts. Sea turtles race to the sea. These guys follow the cosmos. It's pretty wild. It's one thing to follow the sun naturally because it gives off warmth. Sunflowers will literally turn their head to find the sun, which is super creepy, but it's beautiful. These insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their poop towards it. They'd be like, hello Milky Way, and they just... Hieroglyphs of these beetles are seen all over. Like near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, for example, there's a massive scarab monument. And today, if you walk around it nine times, you get good luck. And don't worry, you don't have to roll any droppings at the same time. Don't get dizzy, that's all, it's the only rule. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which ancient Egyptians believed was the sun. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby, but that's because I watched Teletubbies, so, you know, depends. Number seven, surprise each other. Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were a pretty beneficial couple, to say the least. Cleopatra would use Caesar's armies, which in turn would allow her to rule Egypt, while Caesar was eyeing down Cleopatra's extreme wealth. They were the perfect pair. She was able to financially support Caesar enough for him to return to power back in Rome, but how did such a perfect pair meet in the first place? Did Cleopatra swipe right? Hmm, no. Well, a then 52-year-old Julius Caesar visited the much younger Cleopatra, so she then sent a surprise gift to his chambers. She got her crew to roll her up in a carpet or bed sheet, that's not really confirmed, something along those lines, and then delivered her to his door, completely nude. He unraveled a naked Cleopatra, and he's like, okay, hello. That's pretty impressive. Cleopatra was down for fun surprises. While we don't recommend this as an approach ever, it's one worth mentioning on our list. Number six, Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film the adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 BC 
Gengizi between Pharaoh Samek III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well we can't we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's that's uh, how they lost that battle. Number 5, honey coated. Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee, because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand, or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day. Poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four, assassins. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone. The tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays. I get you. The economy was deteriorating. Weather was devastating. Food production. Things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife, T.A., hated his guts. She, along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chief. Chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number three, till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well, if you were servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife. So when you died, you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the Pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two. More tattoos. More tattoos for number two. We love it. You guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff and the whole hippo situation in part one. That was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons. I say it weird. Baboons. Baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting. You're going to jail. Me and seven baboons. Let's carry them into the car. Bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour, and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They trained baboons to pick fruit, make beer, and even entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party, apparently. If their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo on one of my arms. Honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here or here. I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations. We're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like. Thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last, and clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. 
Number 10, Overshadowed and the Beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals. But when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video, stay tuned. When he died in 1479 BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III. But she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came, of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number 9, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things. Huh. The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, you stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number eight, ceremonial seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of Egypt. Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation. It was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen so take this one with a grain of salt but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen. So there. Number seven, deliver me naked. Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens like the one I mentioned before concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about Showing it off, cause girl, if he got it, flaunt it. In order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar, Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy. It's, it's pretty easy. He was around 52 when they met and the Egyptian queen was just like 20 and in her prime, so. She looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack, naked, and carried indoors to Caesar and she was like, have at her, buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor, and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass. Honestly, just do your thing. Work it, girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go, girl. You got this. You get that empire. Number six, gender reveal parties. We've all seen those videos, a guy goes to hit a baseball, he misses it, the baseball breaks and there's pink dust all around his feet and he starts crying, it's wonderful. Gender reveal parties were quite popular, you know, until they started lighting wildfires. But back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. Instead of peeing on a pregnancy test, you would have to use wheat and barley seeds instead. Depending on how those barley crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. They were right 85% of the time, which is quite impressive back in the day. We went from watering crops to burning them. Hashtag, it's a boy. Number five, 
Space Knife. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archaeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with the king. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to be buried with your treasure or belongings. It's why ancient Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so grave robbers can't just sneak in after you pass away and then take all of your goodies. So two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other with gold. Now, with iron being more rare than gold during the Bronze Age, this was quite a big deal. With recent advancements in technology, we're able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescent spectrometry, and according to the journal Meteorites and Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that its material is that of extraterrestrial origin. A blade fell from the sky, and now a king has it. That's pretty insane. Also, aliens? Just saying. Number four, KB-55. Also located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB-55, was found by Edward Arden back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason that we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because we really don't know for sure who's inside. Even the walls of the tombs inside, they aren't covered with beautiful hieroglyphs to tip us off on their history or their ruling, it's just bare. The only hint as to who is buried remains on the walls. It's one hieroglyph that remains, and it was discovered also in 1907, and it translates simply to, the evil one shall not live again. That's very scary. That's definitely scarier than Greg was here. I don't know. Even massive stones were built and set up in order to prevent anything from getting out. Whereas usually with ancient tombs, it's the opposite. So that's pretty scary. The description for those inside the tomb has also been destroyed. So we have really no idea who's in KB 55 or what. <laughs> Number three, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens and they look athletic. They look to be in great shape, when in reality, these pharaohs were probably quite obese. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day and you have baboons dancing around, plus a little dab of honey every, I don't know, eight minutes, yeah, you're gonna gain some weight. Many of these ancient pharaohs had diabetes. And Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong, but historians all agree that she was out of shape and extremely unhealthy. Honestly, I would do the exact same if I was there back then. She was ahead of her time. If somebody made a statue for me, I'd be like, yeah, give it an eight pack, make him extremely jacked and seven two. Can we do that? Sure, no one's gonna ask questions. I'm Dwayne The Rock Johnston, just write it down, please. Number two, marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? Promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining ma even marrying any of my cousins. That's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. Hey, that's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half-sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a, that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about, yeah, that thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result, they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title Heretic King and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year, he started sending out agents to erase names and images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel El Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. Starting off our list at number 10, the first peace treaty. Unusual at the time, absolutely. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 
BC. At this point in history, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was finally underway. Tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. What's left to do now at this point? Ramses II and King Hattusili III both negotiated a peace treaty, where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found right now in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official. Our man Guinness confirms it. Boom, that's how you know. Moving on. Number nine, game night. I love board games, and honestly, that includes Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then, you know? Pass and go, I'm like, okay, I'll pay the tax. I'm respecting this game so far. But ancient Egyptians, turns out they also loved board games. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen, Senate, and 20 Squares, those are some popular games. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC, and the goal here was to reach the center of the spiral. The board was a coiled snake almost. Senate was the most popular game. Kings and queens alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Of course, the rules are still unknown, heavily debated, just like Monopoly today. I'm like, is it 200 or 100, are we sure? But now we have some ideas how Egyptians played Senate. There were three rows of 10 squares, the last five were always decorated. Now it's assumed this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus King Tut was buried with one of these boards, so that's definitely something to do with it. And there's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so you know it was addictive. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms are already so sweaty. Number eight, glamour. Makeup in ancient Egyptian culture was key. Not only did they wear makeup and smell good because they wanted to resemble the very gods they believed in, but makeup had a practical use as well in the daily life of a pharaoh. They believed makeup gave you protection from the gods Ra and Horus. They would put together these beauty kits by grinding down malachite and galena, and then they would create the substance called coal. There wasn't a lot of blending back then. Makeup was often applied directly to the skin using wood or bone. And it wasn't just the ladies as well. Men wore makeup and perfume. Of course, you gotta look good and smell good. Be like, have you seen them? What? I, I wanna wear some of this. They smell like beautifulness. They smell like the afterlife. They smell amazing. Egyptians believed makeup had healing abilities, and honestly, they weren't wrong. Makeup back then had enough lead in them, so eye infections would stay away, ideally. Number seven, Cleopatra's methods. Male rulers took the name Ptolemy and queens were Cleopatra. Her lineage runs deep in the heart of Egypt, but Cleopatra, fun fact, she was not actually Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BCE, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this new wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted centuries. As Cleopatra got older, she was determined to learn Egyptian. And due to political structure, she started to style herself as the goddess Isis. And then in comes Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had a history of his own, obviously, and his, rather than family and power, was filled more with, you know, lust more than anything. He was known to sleep around and then use their power after doing the dirty. When these two crossed paths, history was never the same. In October of 50 BCE, Cleopatra had fled to Syria. Once there, she established an army and returned two years later to face her brother. Cleopatra knew that during this time, she needed all the support she could get, specifically now from the Romans. At the same time, Caesar was looking to collect debts from Cleopatra's father, so they both relied on each other in some way. It was a match made in heaven. Your most compatible has been updated. Right swipe. I would right swipe on Alexander the Great, for sure. I'd be like, who's this handsome man? Mm. Nicknamed Bald Adulterer. Okay, you know, he's trouble. Number six, Yozer. For this one, we're looking into some bowl worshiping. So if you're a fan of bowls, here, this one's perfect for you, weirdly enough. Just north of the Steppe Pyramid of Pharaoh Dozier, archeologist August Mariette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapeum, it's a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, and it's a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. This was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls, these bulls that were said to be sacred, of course, and after their death, they would become immortal. Immortal bulls, that sounds badass and also terrifying, that's very scary. Don't wear red around these guys. Today at Saqqara, there's a massive vault, it's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock, it's huge, and along the sides, there's 24 chambers, each with a sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Just impossible craftsmanship all around, especially at these times, like, oh my god, my wrists are tired just typing about this, let alone doing this. Inside these boxes were animal remains, bones and all that jazz, but back in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. You had to mummify them. 
right? Hence part one and where we are now. How are these tombs built so perfectly weighing over 80 tons? And also, where do these bones come from? I have so many questions. Maybe on part three we'll answer them. Number five, we love cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them. I risk everything just to, yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshipped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it, they're cute. They respected them, they worshiped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid-conversation, a cat will just be like. No, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good, hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. Hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really love them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. But in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, fair. I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you. What should I make it look like? I'm like, yeah, give him an eight pack. Make him jacked. I don't know. Make him look like Michael Jordan. I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball. He misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke. Everyone's like, oh my God gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they're popular back in ancient Egyptian days, but nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You'd have to pee on them, and then however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. I'm just gonna pee on your crop, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really aiming towards a boy this time. We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. And it worked a lot of the time. It's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, worship cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still love them. I still pet them. I ruined my entire night just to get my face right there next to their cute little furry face. But ancient Egyptians, like I said earlier, really loved cats. They respected them, they worshiped them. Even though at the time dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. So if there's ever a cat versus dog argument going on on your end of the screen, cats win. I'm allergic and I'm still saying cats win. That's, that's huge. If you had a cat, it means you had good luck. When cats passed away, they too were mummified back in the day. You would think that alone was plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs went a step further. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and then mourn until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. Next time your friend tells you that their cat passed away, tell them that if they really love them, they'll shave their eyebrows off and then see what they say. Also, you don't have to make your friends shave their eyebrows. Let's leave this one in the past. That's fine. Just be sad with eyebrows. Be like, hmm. Number one, fight a hippo. Egypt's first pharaoh, Menes, although we know next to nothing about his history, there is something there that has historians scratching their heads to this day. At his early time, the pharaoh was setting out to unite all of Egypt under his rule. The time that he ruled as well is considered a rather peaceful time when comparing it to years later. We know that he was well respected, and we also know that after his 63 years of peaceful ruling, he was stomped to death by a hippo. That's horrible, it's a horrible way to go out. He was an elderly ruler at that time. He was surrounded by guards and somehow a hippo got all the way to his chambers, a hippo, and then ended the Pharaoh's life. 
Some suggest that the reason there's nothing written about this pharaoh's tragic, horrible demise is because it's possible that the hippo was his pet. This is why you don't try and tame a beast as a pet. Perhaps this was an early similar situation as the Siegfried and Roy tiger attack. Just stick to smaller magical cats. They're much safer. They won't stop you to death. Oh my god, it's horrible. Kicking off the list at number 10, Ramses II. Ramses II, part two, you see what I'm doing here. He's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramses II is still considered the ruler of rulers. It's not a bad title, not bad at all. In year 30 of his reign, Ramses II was ritually transformed into an Egyptian god. Not bad, I'm turning 30 in a few years. I hope someone turns me into a god or gets me like a bike, <laughs> one of the two, I'll take both. So it was only fair if the spoiled pharaoh erected a bunch of statues of himself. Yeah, big selfies. Ramses put up more selfies than any other pharaoh in history. Most famous of them, the temples of Abu Simbel. There lies a monument dedicated to the late Queen Nefertiti and the Ramseum. We kicked off a part one with Ramses signing the first ever peace treaty, so, so for part two, we had to show some of the glamour side of him, you know? Number nine, over 100 children. Who is this guy, Nick Cannon? Ramses II is the father to over 100 children. Uh, with that, of course, came the, you know, 200 wives, otherwise, ow and how, if it was just one person, ow and how, you know? <laughs> it's guesstimated that Ramses had 96 sons and 60 daughters. Of all those children, Ramses outlived a lot of them. It's almost like living as a king helped, perhaps, maybe, I don't know, maybe you ate better. Maybe, just a hint, just an idea. Eventually, Ramses was succeeded by his 13th son with his favorite queen, Queen Nefertari, giving her the fanciest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Nefertari's tomb contains paintings that some consider are the greatest works of ancient Egyptian art. Not bad, I had like baseball wallpaper on mine growing up. Tomb QV66, he spoiled his lady, look at this. We gotta love him. Her tomb is 520 square meters covered in beautiful art, but in 1904 when Nefertari's tomb was rediscovered, all that was found was her mummified knees. Yeah, all that was left was her kneecaps. What, like, who does this? Raiders had stolen all the treasure prior, sometime in the many moons she had been lying there, and they even took her body and left her knees. Like, what? Monsters. They're like, yeah, grab the treasure, leave the patellas, let's do it. Number eight, ready to strike. Pharaohs may have looked beautiful living and after death, but they meant business, okay? They were protective of their land, their family, their many, many lovers and children. The symbol often worn by pharaohs were symbols of power, a Nemes crown. This crown was a striped headcloth and the back of their head was covered with an aureus symbol, AKA an upside down cobra. The cobra symbol represents that the pharaoh is always ready and willing to attack their enemies, attack them with venom. It's a pretty cool symbol. Mine just says DC Etnies Shoes. I'm like, I don't, this says fight me, if anything. DC Skate Shop in my back. I'm like, yeah, you can just attack me, that's cool. Number seven, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the sixth dynasty. While it's not as flashy or massive as other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing ever, in the religious world, that is. Inside it contains the pyramid texts, these legendary texts. They go all the way back to 2400 BC. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this king, King Teddy, could ascend to the heavens after his death. This isn't bizarre behavior by any means, but King Teddy, he was specific. He wanted to be a star, like a literal star. There are spells and incantations that are in this tomb meant to free the king's soul as he arrives in the cosmos. More specifically for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the hashtag God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to these heavens. It's one thing to be buried with your gold, then you can live another life, but to become a star? I need to expand my dreams, my gosh. King Teddy was onto something here. When I go, in my will, I'm gonna be like, can I become a star, is that possible? Can I just throw me up into the heavens? Can I do that? Or bury me, that's cool. Bury me in Ajax, that works. <laughs> Number six, dung beetles. This one isn't exactly a pharaoh at all, but it's too good to leave out, especially if we're talking about aliens here. It's important. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way. Think about that for a second. That is, let's talk about it. Some animals follow the sun. You know, turtles sprint to the ocean the second they're born to avoid getting plucked up by birds. Now these insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their towards it. Literally, they're, they're poop. They would roll it towards the skies, which is insane. Symbols of these beetles are seen all over, either in hieroglyphics or even in movies, their presence is known. Near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, there's a massive scarab monument. And there's even a legend still to this day behind said statue that if you walk around it nine times, you would find health, wealth, and love. And you'd also probably be a little bit dizzy. 
The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which at the time Egyptians believed was the sun as well. Also known as a scarab face god, which terrifying when you imagine that. Are these bugs just trying to get home into space to their bug alien master? Why does he need so much poop? Whatever DIY project they're working on in the Milky Way probably doesn't smell too good. Number five, Lord Nefertiru. For this next piece of evidence, we'll be directing our focus to the land down under. Australian aliens, baby, let's do it. In the Brisbane Water National Park, to be specific. Egyptian hieroglyphs educate us on our past. There's still so much we don't know, but it's fun to find UFO looking objects within them. It's fun to speculate as we are right now. But when Egyptian texts appear around the world in the middle of nowhere, those UFO hieroglyphs get a bit more concerning. Like the Gosford glyphs, for example. Discovered in the 1970s at Karyong, there's around 300 engravings spread over two sandstone walls. The hieroglyphs are strikingly similar to that of Egypt's. There's birds, even the markings of a scarab, which are those Milky Way poop pushers that I just talked about earlier. Egyptologist Raymond Johnson believes that this is the burial site of Egyptian royal family member Lord Nefertiru, who met his fate around 2600 BC, with some panels telling the story of two prince brothers who came from Egypt and subsequently became shipwrecked. But other panels get into the extraterrestrial goodness. Some of these Gosford glyphs have UFO shapes, with scarabs, birds, and sun symbols popping up as well. Maybe we did have alien aid when it came to laying these royal family members to rest. Number four, Userkaf. Remember earlier when I was talking about those extremely heavy granite coffins? Well, the Sun Temple in Egypt may give us more alien clues as to their purpose. Discovered in 1842, this was the base of a giant monument that apparently used to stand over 150 feet tall. Built by the pharaoh Yuzakaf, founder of the 5th dynasty of Egypt, the temple translates to Stronghold of Ra. Ra being the sun god. This temple at Abu Ghraib was home to one of the world's largest monoliths and its purpose may blow your mind. This obelisk was built out of granite. Now they made things out of granite back then because it contained quartz. Quartz, due to piezoelectricity, was able to convert the Earth's vibrations into energy. Nikola Tesla did something similar. He figured out standing waves, which was the ability to pass energy through the air. Perhaps these granite monoliths were used to teleport people or goods. That would explain the last point about those Australian glyphs. To be fair, I have zero idea how Bluetooth works either. Alien airdropped in Egypt. I'm here for this theory. Number three, Khufu. In order to become a god in the afterlife, these kings would build massive temples or pyramids. The Giza pyramids were built over 4,500 years ago, and to this day, they draw in about 15 million visitors a year. Pharaoh Khufu's is the largest pyramid in Giza, and it was the first pyramid that they started to build, obviously taking the longest. Reaching up to 147 meters high, it took 2.3 million rocks to create this landmark, and its alignment with Orion's belt gives it an extraterrestrial vibe, and with Tesla CEO Elon Musk tweeting aliens built the pyramids, obvi, we now have to ask just how did thousands of workers achieve this? The placement of the pyramid is also unique as well. It's aligned perfectly with the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. That much accuracy back then with the stars and the earth and the heavens, they must have gotten help from alien friends or else they had the world's biggest protractor. Number two, hippo problems. Do you have any idea how fast hippos are in real life? I had no clue my entire life. They're really fast, they fly at you, they're like dinosaurs. Hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Yeah, I'll just lead with that. Pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh ever, so it felt fitting to include some pet problems in our list. We don't know much about the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, that's where we're talking. But what we do know for certain is that King Menes ruled over Egypt during a peaceful time, and he was stomped to death by a hippo. It's literally how his history.com says it, in that order. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and a hippo got him. I don't think there's a harder way to go out, honestly, in my opinion. It's a mystery still, thousands of years later, but look at zoos today. I don't know, maybe a hippo didn't like living like a king. Maybe he wanted to live like Shrek and just splash around and be dirty. He's an animal, he's literally a hippo, you know? And finally coming in at number one, a renewed passport. I'll be honest, right now, I currently have no idea where my passport is. Chris, do you know where yours is? Yeah. Wow, we have an adult here. Wow, an adult, that's lovely. I always panic and search for it 13 hours before a flight. I am the worst to travel with. Passports are important, obviously, and they're a pain in the ass to replace. But did you know you can still get one even if you've been dead for, I don't know, thousands of years? There's a fun fact. Pharaoh Ramses II, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers, got a passport back in 1974. 
Yeah, you heard me. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided it's time to send the Lost King off to Paris to get, you know, a little touched up, being dead that long and all. Now obviously you're not going to list this pharaoh as luggage, that's so rude. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute. On the passport he had his age, his occupation, king obviously, and in case it wasn't clear it was stated that the king too was deceased. Anyone who's seen The Mummy can obviously, you know, relax at that point. Those are the top 10 unusual things spoiled pharaohs did in history. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters, and I'll see you next time on Bumblebee. Peace. I like hear things, man. I thought that bush was moving for a second. What the I was like, someone's definitely there right now. Number eight, Queen Nefertiti. After a scan was done on King Tut's tomb, there were cracks found on the north and earth walls. East, Taylor, east, not earth. There were cracks found on the north and east side walls. So we believe that this is a secret passageway to Queen Nefertiti, the ruler during the 14th century BC, and also wife to King Tut. Queen Nefertiti's parents are also still unknown to this day, so that adds to it. And with ancient texts depicting that these kings and queens would leave Earth and then later return, perhaps they are both descendants of extraterrestrials. And this flying sun disk that they worshipped was not the sun, but rather a winged alien ancestor. Number five, Queen Nefertiti's resting place. So yes, on one hand, 3D scanning technology is vital when it comes to these ancient sites. We're able to figure out King Tut's medical issues from thousands of years ago. It's impressive, it's great. But thanks to this new technology, we're also finding hidden chambers in these tombs as well. Another theory surrounding the queen, the lost queen, Nefertiti, is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this at all. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. But King Tut passed away at age 19, so many believe that his own burial chamber at that point wasn't even built yet. So instead, they had to use hers, they had to improvise. A radar survey conducted around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us a possible hidden chamber, right behind the north wall of the burial chamber. We still haven't found her final resting place, but perhaps this recent 2021 discovery of an ancient city will hold us off until then. Look at this, we missed this on the news. Where was all this? Crazy. Number four, a fake beard. Not really unusual considering the times, but this is definitely worth a mention. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, and there were only just a few that were women in total. But during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. This was her goal, this was her vision. The pharaoh fake beard, massive muscles, historians believe this was done as an act of politics. It was done on purpose to make a point. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson then took the throne, Thutmose III. And then he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Number three, no more religion. This was a huge deal in ancient Egypt, rightfully so. The pharaoh Akhenaten thought it would be a great idea to just end multiple religious beliefs. Yep, yeah, just uh, stop. Okay, now we just do the one. Traditional Egyptian culture would believe in multiple gods, but this pharaoh couldn't keep up, so he convinced everybody to believe in just one god, Aten. Well, only days after his passing, the people of Egypt said, screw that, we're gonna go back to multiple beliefs, that was working a lot better for us, thank you sir. And then also we're destroying every piece of evidence that involves you for trying that nonsense. Yeah, temples, cooking pots, anything with his image, gone and ideally forgotten. It wasn't until the 19th century when we realized this pharaoh once ruled. 